Charles Beeler is an alumni with uh, The Cube. He's also a general partner at El Dorado Venture Capital Firm. Uh, is it El Dorado Partners? What's El Dorado official? Ventures. Uh, El, Do El Dorado Ventures. Charles is one of the rising stars in venture capital, especially in the converged networking area. He's obviously had a huge successful exit with Compellent recently, went public, got acquired by Dell. Um, and uh, just overall, you got your hands in a lot of the stuff that, uh, quite frankly, wasn't fashionable 10 years ago or a few years ago. And, and now it's hot. Storage is sexy, exploding. Yep. Data is now the next big thing. And obviously, data kind of implies storage. Also is the heart of the cloud, heart of mobility. So uh, welcome to Inside the Cube with Dave Vellante. So, so we just want to talk to you about uh, you know just the market trends that you're seeing, and obviously you finance a lot of growing startups. And you're involved in follow-on financings. Um, tell us what you're seeing out there. Yeah, first I should apologize to you guys because last time we sat here, I had been going back and forth between phone calls with Compellent and Dell and other folks, but uh, <laughs> wasn't quite able to We're talk really about sorry it. you had to do oh. that. Well, yeah, all why three par was being bought, and all you know. three par was being bought, uh, and then though you had Phil on that same day, and right. I'm watching Phil down there. That guy is he is stoned. He He's was just, stoned. Nothing's going on. We're just we were asking us. So what's the story? You gonna get you know? He's like, oh, yeah, we're just happy Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a great outcome. With Phil, do you? He's a what a phenomenal CEO. You guys have spent some time with the company. Yeah. Great company. It was a yeah. it was a great exit. But you know, honestly, this is the part about venture where you spend a lot of time uh, working with sort of behind the scenes, helping companies, trying to make them successful. And the 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 reward, yeah, there's great return. But the reward is looking back with those guys. We yeah. funded them in 02 first venture round, my partner Jeff Hink and I did that deal together when he was at a different firm, and seeing that company go from three people to 500 people, go public, stick with it after the fact, that's really where this whole business comes together, something that, you know, when you look back over your career at the points that you really remember, it's not, I made X on this deal, it's, I got to work with these guys, I get to see them actually build something yeah. and point back to it, and so, we it, worked it was a lot a, with Larry Asman, who's another yeah, guy, Larry is just a tremendous a, individual. Those three yeah. founders are unbelievable, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, Two for two in deals. The other one, what net net after selling it was worth about five hundred million uh, post the transaction, right. and uh, and then compelling on the heels of that. And these are people. I mean, no one out here even knows yeah, yeah. who these guys are. So anyway, what's going on? Um, well, first of all, tell us what you've invested in. What are the new hot deals? So yeah, I see your rising star with compelling and you yeah, all the so big exits. The, uh, you made a lot of money for your firm and I'm yourself. I feel old, so I like you calling me a rising star. Yeah. It keeps me back. And the, I uh, yeah, the, you know, the one you're from the did, Midwest, and you know you're out in Silicon Valley and. Yeah, nice guys do finish now. first. Twelve years now. Twelve years. Um, so the most recent one I did uh, that we can talk about, we've got a few that we've done recently that uh, including some kind of big data deals that you guys will be the first to hear about when we start talking about them. But uh, it was Atlantis Computing, which you and I think yeah. we'll catch up yeah. on it sometime. I wouldn't put it in the, the big data area, but uh, it's really focused on virtual desktop. And it, it goes back to your storage point. We, a few years ago, started really looking at virtual desktop and saying, is this a market that that truly has an opportunity to take off beyond kind of call center operations or sort of thing? Is there a possibility that, you know, the CEO of a large company, say at JP Morgan, is actually going to have a virtual desktop sitting on their desk that they interact with as though it's their, if it's their PC, if it's their computer. I mean, it's a no-brainer. I mean, everyone sees that. Where's, where do you, everyone where's, can see it. The problem Where's was, the state of the union on this? When you really looked at where the technology was, you see Citrix come along quickly, VMware. Frankly, I still think on the desktop side playing catch-up, but those yeah, two, yeah. you know, yeah, the, right. most of the combinations we're seeing are Zen desktop running on, on VMware server uh, stuff. So um, we're, we're seeing it come along, and this, so that's not the problem. Right, the, the terminals are not the problem. There are other bottlenecks that relate specifically to, and we talked about this with the, the Wikibon stuff you guys just put out yep. in the post you were just mentioning. Um, the, the issue where the bottlenecks that happen that are unique to virtual desktop, we saw storage as the primary bottleneck. And it's not it's not storage's fault. It's actually, you know, frankly, Microsoft's fault, although it's hard to blame them too. <laughs> it's Oracle's fault. Yeah. <laughs> Oracle and Microsoft. It's easy can't, to blame can't Oracle. Can't go wrong, just well, blame Oracle and Microsoft. Microsoft, they didn't design their OS with the idea that people would be running the compute remotely and having a shared storage environment. They built their OS to sit on a PC with a hard drive that sat there that the OS essentially owned. So anytime there wasn't something going on, the OS could say, hey, let's do a little defrag or yeah. you know, answer this quick question for me, do a quick call, and it, it wasn't an issue. You take that same OS and you run it in a server where it's host, you know, working with thousands of different end users, and then you share the storage so that the OS doesn't actually know and can't really know when the storage is being used or not being used. 
and it just says, well, hey, my user's not doing anything, so I'll just drop down and hang out and play in the storage for a while. It creates massive, massive I.O. bottlenecks. And so what you're seeing, and, and I think Pegler said it right, you know, it's sort of every dollar that you spend on, on the front end of this, if you're spending three to ten dollars on the back end in storage, yeah. where I would dispute his view is, they're, they're saying, well, now you just need to optimize the workloads to, to spend a little less. Our view is that there's an opportunity to, frankly, eliminate storage from that environment to a large degree and, and really only use your storage environment for what it should be used for, which is user data, application data. Everything related to the OS, don't even stick it down in the storage area network. Put it closer to the server. Put it closer, yeah. put it in a VM. Ha have software handling it at the VM level. And so, we've been trolling around looking for this. The VMware guys actually were great. They pointed us to a couple companies they thought were interesting, and Lannis was one of them. Mm. Uh, the, the founder, Chaitan Venkatesh, is a guy you should definitely get to know. Not very well known outside of the virtual desktop world. Brilliant, brilliant engineer. Great CTO presents incredibly well, customers What's love employee them. count for those guys right now? Oh God, it's going quick. We're probably close to 40 now. Um, and they're headquartered in? Headquartered in Mountain View. Okay. Uh, CEO Bernard Hargindigi, which you'll have to practice. We know, we know Bernard. <laughs> Bernard. We got some photos of Bernard from VMworld. Yeah. He didn't actually make it on the queue, but. Old pro, a lot of background experience, one of the most hardworking guys I've ever seen. So essentially what Atlantis does is it sits, you can put it in a VM, it's just software, you can run it in an appliance, and it offloads all the OS specific stuff for virtual desktop. Cisco just put out a white paper that ran uh, an environment with, with uh, Citrix on VMware, server, uh, Zen Desktop obviously, uh, with a big net app box, and then they put the Atlanta software in. And what they got out of it and they published was 90 to 92% offload of reads and writes. So if you think of it, literally 90% reduction in the I.O. going into storage. And, and clearly virtual desktop storage is, is, is I.O. bound. There's nothing to do with capacity. It's all I.O. issues. Right. So you, you suddenly reduce by a factor of 10 the amount of data storage that you actually need to run this stuff. It's a pretty compelling story. Uh, and so anyway, we uh, we looked at it, we liked it, we talked to some people. The most important guys we talked to were J.P. Morgan, who's the biggest customer. Uh, and they were very positive on it, walked us through what they'd done with the technology, walked us through what they'd done to help it uh, along, and uh, and jumped in. So that was So does Jamie Dimon have May. a virtual desktop? He does, he does. And the first guy to use it was Guy Chiarello, who's the CIO there. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd been running a sort of what they call a version one of their virtual desktop. And, uh, and so my understanding, this is from the, the JP Morgan, guys, Guy was the first one to use it. He said, if, if I'm not using it, it's going to be hard for me to pitch senior investment bankers to use it. And it as I actually just talked to a very senior exec in the investment banking group unrelated to this and asked, you know, hey, do you know, what do you have on your desk? Is it a virtual machine? And he goes, no, it's virtual. And he goes, it's awesome. It screams. The performance out of this stuff is so much better than what they were getting from their desktops, and they're doing it cheaper than what they're paying for their PCs. So to your first point about can we get out of the niche of call centers or you know, specific, yeah. specific you know, military or government niches. Yep. Now, the, now, you're right. The big issue when you talk to VM, when you talk to customers, it's always been sort of the TCO and storage is the big culprit. So if you solve that, one of the theories that we put forth at VMworld was, you know what, maybe the whole notion of desktop needs to change. Maybe it needs to include you know, mobile devices, it really should be about the virtual user and the data and the applications. Absolutely. Does it, does it have to get there or do you feel like this bit flip that Atlantis and guys like that are putting forth is enough to really start adoption moving? I think, uh, I, and I, I would rarely say this about companies, I think Atlantis and, and other people playing around with this have the potential to change the, the cost of operating and, and implementing and operating a, a virtual desktop infrastructure so significantly that that alone could change the adoption cycles. We're seeing a lot of companies out there doing proof of concepts that die on the vine, and we're hearing from really, really big partners that you know their biggest issue with their virtual desktop work is they're getting guys to try it, but they can't get them to scale past a few hundred users yeah. because they start doing the math on, on the storage in particular, and it, it's just way too expensive to justify. Yeah, everybody's so, looking at it. There's no I, question about it. I think the software's there to the point where it works just fine. It's it's can you actually implement this in a way where it's cost effective? And, and the, the the argument today is, hey, the high end guys are only going for performance. They don't care about anything else. It's true in certain circumstances, but most mostly, if you want to see adoption, it, it's got to be cost justified. And so, yeah, I think that happens. But the software is already to the point where you can run. And if you're a Jay Morgan, you can run your entire desktop on an iPad. It's, it's already there. You just need to be able to implement the system so you can actually go and take advantage of that. So I think that the key drivers are one, you've got to solve those problems, and two, as people start to think, you're right, beyond the desktop compute environment to say, where are all the other places I'd want to access this application or be able to hop onto my desktop quickly? That starts to open the doors to say, okay, it's, it's a cost, 
competitive solution, but the opportunities it creates are so much greater than you know, sitting there with a PC. So, and, uh, and I think we're there. I mean, I think we're there. It's going to take time to adopt. Gartner's telling us it's a $40 billion market next year. I don't believe it. It, it will Gartner? Take, yeah. Who? Yeah. I never they got a lot of attention two years ago when they said it was going to be a multi- Yeah, and they repeated it money. and they delayed it a year kind of thing. But, uh, but, their, but, their, but their fundamental reasoning is sound, which is people have a problem and, you know, in concept, this solves it. So. I think so. What was interesting when I talked to those guys is their storage team, uh, when that report came out, knew of the report and had not done anything on the virtual desktop side. I asked them their view on it. And they said, we haven't really looked at storage and the implication and anything else. And I know they've done big a lot. Baby. They've done a lot <laughs> since then. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I think it's a big opportunity. It's a big opportunity for the compute guys, for the storage guys. There's a, it's a new market. Well, let's talk about uh, what you're looking at in terms yeah, of so your, your investment it. thesis. What what so, kinds of deals you're looking at? Obviously, I was just at a, a talk in, in uh, Hacker Dojo in Mountain View. Ton of people, and a lot, you know, not just young kids going to Y Combinator. We're talking about like you know, serious computer scientists, data scientists doing some some work you know what is what's yeah we're seeing uh john we're seeing a uh a, a return to what i would call the enterprise return to infrastructure i mean don't get me wrong the, the consumer side of the venture business has been a phenomenal bit area for a long time not an area i spend a lot of time although i certainly wish i were in six deals that we can all think off the top of our head but uh we're i've been talking to some consumer guys some late stage funds who are directing the partners to get more back into this kind of big data stuff in the enterprise i think some of the exits that you look at components certainly being one obviously isilon and three par and the tesla there, there's some phenomenal outcomes here for really compelling companies and so people are realizing that we are in a new shift I think uh, Werner Vogel said it very well today. We're kind of day one of this concept of bringing big data, leveraging the cloud to really do analysis around it. And there's just going to be over, and the Catalyst guys, if you ask Frank Quattrone to go through a presentation, he'll talk you through how he sees this sort of wave of consolidation and the wave of innovation that they're seeing today that they've been a big part of. So, so is that the question? That's a good question. So um, two questions. On the M&A, Dave and I were talking earlier yep. about how you know the big company's going to have a big data store. You're buying EMC bought Greenplum, they bought Isilon. Uh, obviously, you've been involved in some big M and A's. So, one, we'll talk about the, the M and A side of it, but also let's talk about what a company needs to do to get sold. So, Compellent went public, mm -hmm. Repar went public. It, do these big storage companies have to go public first to uh, get their valuation up? I mean. That's just no. a legitimate question, or can they, they get sold for one billion dollars as a private domain, company? Right. They can't. I mean, Equalogic's a great example, right? I mean, it's a couple years old, but it's no. Well, different. they were right, just about to go public, weren't they? Or? Right, <laughs> and, and and they're and they got a they got a public company deal, no escrow, structured as a public acquisition, yeah, right. as a private company, and their whole point was, look, we're going to go public, and you can see the comps right now. You know, Iceland Compound, these guys are worth X. It, it's going to be worth this much money. Why not? save yourself a little by today. I don't think you need to. In reality, um, I think people talk about, you know, you go public, you get exposure to the markets. If you haven't gone out and gotten to know the potential acquirers and possible partners beforehand, you probably haven't done a really great job, right? Yeah. There's there's a big corp definition. We, we tell our companies this all the time. Grow to try to be a public company. But along the way, you've got to make sure that the people out there know you. Yeah, they've lost, you know, EMC's lost a few deals to you, but they don't really know who you are, what you're about, where you're going, unless you go in and sit down and talk to them. And, and I think too many startups are really reluctant to go in and at least share a little bit with their erstwhile competitors around, here's what we're doing and here's why. And, and I and so, so they're not you, doing any sense of marketing around the, the the success of the buyouts. You know, like you get noticed more when you go public. Obviously, uh, for the for the acquirers, in reality, it's a real pain in the ass once you've gone public. I mean, look at look at Dell with three par, right? Look at NetApp with Data Domain. If those had been private companies when they made those acquisitions, there would never have been competition because they could have locked them up in a much more solid way than you can. Once you go public, you can't. Well, you, Frank Quattrone doesn't want the lock up because he loves the bidding process. Frank loves the bidding process, but I think they'd be the first to admit that you know when they signed the deals that they did with Dell, when they signed the deals uh, on, well, Data Domain was a different structure in terms of but how Frank Slootman didn't mind it either too much. Slootman <laughs> didn't mind it at all. No, Slootman was happy. But the, the, they truly signed the deal with Dell, not thinking there was going to be an interloper, right? I mean, they Very signed clearly, that deal yeah, thinking it was right. the best deal yeah. they were going to get. They were pleasantly surprised to see HP come back in, and obviously the timing of the whole Mark yeah, yeah. departure was interesting. Uh, in that, I think Great enabled those guys yeah. to come back. Yeah, and it might then, not have happened. If, but if, then if, that's where the catalyst guys and other bankers who do it jump back in and really can help drive additional yeah, yeah, value. Yeah. But but if you think about you know the losers on those, NetApp made the first bid and then lost it in the main. 
Dell yeah, made the first pitch at three part, part, lost three part, which by the way is going to be great for Dell. They're going to be so much happier that they own Compellent than they would be if they own three part. Yeah, I think you're biased, but that's okay. Michael Dell talked about it, Davos, which is not that's something your I was company, at, but I saw. No, I'm biased, but I also knowing what they need as a company and the fit, it's a great fit for that. Yeah, company. it's a big jump to three par. It's, you know, it's it, a it, jump it, to between three where par, they are now yeah, and leaves and, a gap in the Clarion yeah. product line where you know you can argue they're going to keep using Clarion. I don't, I don't work at Dell. I can't tell you. But there's a much better overlap for their customer base, frankly, with where Compellent is. And if you see where Compellent's been going continually, it's up. Three par has been talking about what they've got coming down a bit, but also going up. I, I just, I honestly think it's a better. Well, fit. I think three par is a much better fit for HP as well. I, yeah, know, I, I, I do. I, I think I, so. I, although I, I sometimes have a hard time fully understanding the HP storage group. I, Donatelli should, I assume, make pretty good work in the next year or two of, of, of kind of cleaning that up in a way where people can really understand what the products are, where they fit, and what they're trying to push. Uh, but back to this, so if if NetApp had bought Data Demand as a private company, they could have locked them up in a way there's no way someone else could have come in and bought them. They would not have lost out the deal. If you look at NetApp has not tried to make a public acquisition since then, and I've heard from people that they don't know that they ever will again because they feel like... Is NetApp the last standing independent? I mean, we talk about them being a niche player. Obviously, they are in storage relative to the new definition of storage, but, I mean, they're a $5 billion they're niche. They're the last big one. I mean, yeah. do they have to buy? Can they do the organic... Will the market move too fast for them? Can they remain independent? And can uh, they, I, I, they I think should they speculate. certainly can. The market appears to believe that they will not, given where that company's valued today compared to where it was you know, 18 months ago. Uh, I actually think NetApp, when you look at the, the large storage companies, has probably done more to differentiate themselves and focus on, on specific solutions. So for instance, NetApp and Virtual Desktop, I'd say has gone further than any of the other big storage vendors to actually try to develop solutions to address this problem that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, the CTO uh, and one of the senior architects from NetApp in, I don't know, six months ago talking about what they're doing. And they're they're literally talking about very specific use cases in big markets that, they, that they're trying to go out and address. Um, so I think they, they certainly could be a standalone but it's, you know, we were going talking, back to this yeah. consolidation wave, it's hard to bet on that if someone who has enough capital and enough. Yeah, you know, we were talking to Ziotech. They were in town last week yeah. and Clever Safe. Good friends of yours. Um, <laughs> another Midwest company, Clever Safe from Chicago, uh, MIT guys. So, uh, you know, know. Clever Safe guys. Yeah. They do the yeah, dispersal Zio, technology. You know those guys or no? I don't know Clever Safe. Pretty interesting technology. They do this uh, really dispersed storage. They basically slice it up and sort of yep, goes yep. beyond RAID. It kills sort of RAID. Cloud RAID. RAID. Right, they slice it up, and if you lose a slice, you can you can recreate it. But if you steal the slice, you you, you can't do anything with it. It's encrypted. It's very interesting technology. You should take a look at this. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's very it's in yeah, it's very well, clever. Of all actually, clever yeah, safe. Yeah. Just Jeff, take a look it's at a it. Good it's take, a good take for sure. Yeah, but these guys are all private companies, and they're all doing yeah. well on the revenue side. But they, again, private. So yeah, and Zio, I don't I don't know what their revenue is. I know what it was seven years ago. And my understanding is it's apparently smashing it out of the park with the new product. They they've just changed launched. a lot. The ice yeah. stuff that they uh, they got out of Seagate. Um, Gave them kind of new life, you know. They, I don't know the new team, frankly, but I, my sense is it's the, the probably a better fit. They got a new CEO who's, who knows the market. Moved it to where the whole development team for the ice stuff is in Colorado. Yeah. Um, well, you know, yeah. you know the story in Ziotech, and they they lost oh, yeah. their way a while ago when they tried to get into information management. They forgot about storage. They, sued they, they, they innovated a way. lot of this stuff, you know, <laughs> I mean, early on. And then, and then well, what's interesting? Compellent and three par and everybody what's else. What's interesting, though, I mean, the the if you think about Ziotech, the first, you know, so John, Phil, and Larry started the company, right? Uh, and really, John and Larry, in terms of their technical vision on what that could be. They built it, great success, sold it to Seagate. I think they were very excited about the opportunity to build the next generation of that. And, you know, it's a big company, things change, and it ended up not being an opportunity that was there for them. Right. So they went away from that and looked back at what Zyotech had, which is a really compelling technology, and thought, there's still a better way to do it, which is how compelling came about. So I think the challenge for Zyotech is when it went into Seagate, you know, it was a small business, I think soon after it was bought, they kind of looked and said, and I know because I've heard from EMC guys and others, and, and a senior Seagate guy said, we started getting calls from our big customers saying, what are you doing? You just bought a competitor, and yeah. you want me to spend you know eighty million dollars in di on right. disc with you? And Lucy was super sensitive to that. Yeah, and, and he should be. What's so the point? It, it kind of got pushed down quickly, yeah. and as a result, the technology didn't go anywhere for a while. The Oak guys took it out, and I think the reality is it just took time to get people around to the idea of hey, it was a great technology. It still sells, but you got to do something different. And uh, and you know, so I think the ice thing, it, it, it's a good move. I, honestly, I don't know enough about it. The, the question that I keep 
hearing from people is question of whether is it really that compelling or is it a little bit gimmicky because it's a different way to think about storage but the guys I've talked to who've looked at it have said you know, it's a different way to look at it so much so that it it can potentially bring out some challenges around you know you're putting disk in there and guaranteeing them for five years and these things typically fail in three and do you end up building a huge liability behind it and I think Pegler and these guys would explain it probably much better than I could and tell me why I'm wrong but that's my only question on Zion. Well, I mean, but, but I mean, for them, they're trying to come out of something different, different than thin provisioning. You sort of miss that and, that wave, and credit to them the virtualization they, wave. So they got to try something different. Yeah, and, and and you know, the performance results look pretty interesting. I wanted to say one thing about Compellent. I left the storage business for ten years, and I, you guys made such a great call investing in that company. When I saw John, when I came back after ten years, and I saw what Compellent had, I was in a briefing with Larry Esmond. I said, "Does this stuff really work?" Yeah. Because if this really works, you guys are going to hit a huge home run. And sure enough, I mean, that yeah, whole automated tiering thing, just absolutely brilliant, elegant, simple. And now the whole world, EMC, HP, IBM, is sort of copying it. Now, of course, if they heard me say that, they'd say, no, ours is different. Yeah, it's, the, it's the same fundamental concepts that, that Compellent yeah. made yeah. work. No, they so. did a great, and I don't, know, I don't know if you had Gary Ornstein on later. Or maybe he was on earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Gary was the first VP marketing over at Compellent. Did a, yeah, he's now at Fusion IO, which I'm talking about a company I wish I was an investor. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, the, uh, smoking hot. Gary did a phenomenal job taking new concepts and getting getting them set up in a way where you could explain them to a market that really had that same question: Does this really work, and why do I need to use it? It was a, a, such an impressive transition to take that technology build to, to talk to. You know, Gary was hanging out in our offices for four or five months before the Fusion IO gig and uh, really just looking at a bunch of stuff with us and bringing companies through. And, and he came in and said, you know, these guys call me. And I think everyone he asked about Fusion IO, the answer was, you're crazy if you don't go over there. Mm -hmm. And everything I've heard about the company yeah. and, and seen is it's doing great. They're doing great. It's yeah. really well with what these guys are doing here. So, but back to your original question. Well, the M&A. So, like so what's the distribution of M&As? Is, is there opportunities for um, kind of what I'd say low end M&A, you know, 15 to 50 million? Hundred to three hundred, is there now Absolutely, an opportunity, yeah. in the, especially in the data space? Because the trend is everyone wants a big data story, but no one really knows what that means. Um, yeah, I think if you look at most of the acquisitions happening, it, they're they're the smaller deals, right? I mean, the the deals that are really getting announced on a regular basis are the kind of fifty to five hundred private company acquisitions. It still will, for from an acquisition perspective, from the venture business, be the bread and butter of, of returns, IPOs. You know, rare, but when they happen, they're great. You know, venture guys don't often look at post -IPO, post IPO acquisitions as an outcome. Yeah. You know, we held on to a lot of our compound stock because we believed in it. So did our co-investor there. Uh, you know, you look at Iceland guys, the Sequoia guys. I believe held on to everything they held in it because they believed in it. That's a it's a hard thing to do in the public markets as a yeah. venture investor. So you know, right. most of the exits from an acquisition side you're seeing you know, pre-public. Um, so, but to answer your question, going back to some of the Catalyst guys walked through, they they believe that with the announcement by Cisco of the UCS platform, where Cisco essentially announced, we're going into compute, we're going to compete with a bunch of guys we've been partners and friends with forever. It, it sent off alarm bells and all the other major vendors, who, you know, HP obviously, Dell and others who said, you know, we, we can no longer rely on our little market being the market, or big market being the market we own, and Cisco doing their thing, and you know, Oracle doing their thing, and Oracle buying Sun mm -hmm. certainly didn't help. And since, if you go back to that announcement, if, and then look at the acquisitions that have happened since then, mm -hmm. I, I think it rings out very true. And, and by the way, this is something that those guys said to us before the three-part deal ever came about. So this is something last spring, they were saying, we think there's going to be a massive wave here, and we think it's a 10-year wave. We think that these companies are looking to become you know, individually capable of doing compute, network, store, the virtualization piece where EMC has you know, a huge leg up given their ownership. Of, uh, of VMware, these are these are areas where all these companies are now starting to consolidate because they can't be a long-term partner with the other the other players around the table, the multi-billion-dollar companies. And so, from a startup perspective, that's an exciting yeah. thing because these guys certainly they innovate. And to your point on the compelling stuff, they make announcements. But invariably, when you really look at the technologies that have changed those businesses over time, it's been through acquisition. You know, Green Plum, where Tucci's been out talking about it for good reason. Those guys are here. Uh, obviously, they're very, very happy with what they got out of Data Domain. Yep. Um, 
it, so the, the belief is that on the enterprise side, infrastructure side, we could over the next 10 years just see a continued sort of steady flow of opportunity. If you're a smart founder, understands it, knows a market that you can go and build something in, you may not have to go very far before one of these guys says, I know if I own that product or I own that technology and put it through my eco ecosystem, it goes from a $10 million a year business to a 200, yeah. and I want to own it before the five other guys out there do. And to close on that point, the other piece that's compelling, and I think there's a lot to be said about these the valuations being paid for these deals is, and what's good I think for entrepreneurs and for the venture guys, it's not like there's one buyer, right? There's not one company that might acquire it. You're talking Cisco, EMC, VMware, potentially separately in some of these things. You're looking at, you know, clearly NetApp and Dell and oh, HP or maybe and Oracle, Oracle and IBM. He's driving the price up. So you've got, you've got six or seven very viable major companies that are going to start competing mm. it's an for these resources. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so as a startup, going back to what we talked about pre-IPO, you should do everything you can to be out in front of as many of those guys as possible. Make sure they know what you're doing. Find places to partner with them. Make sure that they're seeing you in the market, not just because you're beating them and you're you know, sort of needling them from behind, as NetUp used to call all the storage guys, Zyotech and Pano, there's the ankle biters, but, but literally that they understand why you're beating them. What's your technology? Don't tell them what. I mean, what do you guys do that's, that's different? How are you winning these customers? That's the way, if you get noticed by a few of these folks, if you yeah. think that's the way you want to exit, that's the best opportunity to be exposed in a way where when they're sitting around talking about what do we want to buy in the next 12 months, your name's likely to come up. So you saw this wave of innovation seven years ago with the you know the automated tiering, the thin yep. provisioning, the virtualization, and that's, that's basically done now. You've seen a lot of money go into these cloud on-ramp guys and even cloud, so you see us are Nasuni and Certus sucking up a bunch of money, some others. Yep. Yep. You're seeing Nirvanix as a new CEO. Is that sort of the next wave here in, in storage, is the cloud on ramp in the cloud itself and and is that potentially disruptive to the guys who are selling here pay me you know 10 million dollars in capex up front pay me a maintenance yeah. and versus the whole pay as you go you know elastic model what are your thoughts on uh, that? it's it's a it's the billion dollar question right and I, I think the answer is I mean it's a little bit in the middle yes it partly depends uh, and it, it partly depends on who the customers are, but it also depends on what some of these storage guys end up doing over the next couple of years. When I, I, Certus and the, the founder of that had started a company called Jive Networks years ago that yep. it wasn't a successful deal, Dan to Casper, but I think it was a great uh, experience for him to then go and build Certus on. And, and we're not involved in Certus, but I've heard great things about the company. Um, there's no reason that the storage guys, in particular if you think about the big storage guys who now you know, provide compute, provide network, provide storage, there's no reason those guys can't provide an on-ramp to a cloud. And it doesn't have to be their cloud, it could be the public cloud and anyone's, right? So there, there's no reason that that market isn't something that can be included in, um, in their business. I think it's highly likely that most of them acquire that capability. Um, I think the Certus guys would argue, which is probably a, a decent argument, that uh, you want to be able to be vendor neutral in your decisions, both in terms of what you have on site and what you're then loading off to. Yeah. And then my personal view on cloud storage is that, and I don't think it's a controversial one by any stretch of the imagination, it's certainly going to take time. There, there are things that will be offloaded sooner rather than later. There will clearly be companies who use it as kind of overflow, especially in certain application areas where, okay, you know, on, on the email side, I've got a bunch of old emails that are sitting there. If I get to a point where I start to spike and I need more capacity, I can take some of that stuff and throw it off. I mean, it's effectively near line storage and I'll just treat it that way. Uh, clearly the big data piece where you're taking huge chunks of, of data that maybe you want to run a lot of analysis on one time or just stick somewhere where you don't want to pay a lot for it, but you don't want it clogging up your sand because you're not accessing it every day, makes a lot of sense. But it's not, I don't, I personally don't think it's going to be an overnight shift where suddenly all the enterprises stop buying storage and just shift out to the cloud. Yeah, I mean, two thirds of the of the 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 enterprise data, according to the estimates that I've seen, you talk to guys in the Wikibon community, about two thirds of it is sort of t tier three or higher. You know, I think that's you know yeah. two, tier two and a half or tier three, and that those are the candidates for it. And you think about these automated tiering systems like the, those that Compel and popularized. Why not have a tier that goes to the cloud? Now, how disruptive is that? I don't know if the core stuff still stays on premise, um, but people want to buy that whole IT as a service model, and they can't get yep. it today, and so 
looks like it has some legs from your stamp, I mean, from the VC standpoint, and whether or not it's disruptive, I, I don't know yet. I haven't yeah, seen it yet. Dave, I agree, and, and I think the challenge that you're gonna see on the cloud stuff is, so that tier three data is very, it has very little value to the enterprise. Mm. Uh, so the cloud guys who want to start handling that are going to need to come up with pricing, pricing, you know, price numbers in terms of what's the cost per gig or however you want to handle it, that make it worthwhile for me to throw it out there and pay on a monthly basis to have it out there. Because if they've already got the storage capacity in house, they, they could literally drop it to the whatever tier they want in terms of whatever they're running it on. If that's going to be cheaper, because they don't think anyone's ever going to access, access it again or you know, once in a blue moon, is that going to be cheaper than putting it out to an external resource where they're paying on a regular basis? And I think, you know, Savas is clearly trying to do it. You'll see others. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to figure out how to how to separate out their storage offerings between a, hey, you've got the stuff that you want access to, it, it's high availability, and we're going to give you just the cheapest, cheapest possible way to throw this stuff out, so sort of fire and forget that it's there until that guy comes in and wants to see an email from 10 years ago, and you'll have, it, it's going to take him a little time, but for the savings you're going to get, it's worth it to, to leave it out there. I, and that's going to be, to me, that's going to be the question. Of, can I just take old resources I have for the next few years and, and keep dropping it to that before I start to think about paying someone on a monthly basis? But I do agree. I think that's an opportunity. I think more compelling is the opportunity over time to start taking much more important data, you know, the tier one, you know, tier two kind of stuff, and figuring out how to get customers comfortable, enterprises comfortable, that putting out in the cloud does make sense for all the reasons that you know people are arguing about here for big data. It makes sense. You just have to be willing to take the leap of faith and try it a little bit over time. Yeah, and, and there may not be enough of that type of, of data today that you know, was mission critical, if you want to call it that, that's sort of candidates for the cloud, yep. so we'll see. I have a question on, on just big data in general and investment opportunities. I mean, you saw it with Web 2.0. We were talking about the consumer plays before. Um, you know, when you get a market like this that has a lot of hype to it, how do you squint through that and determine, okay, you know, is this real? Does it matter to you and your business? And, and you know, what's your you know, telescope telling you or even you know, microscope telling you about this trend? I mean, clearly yeah. Hadoop is, is overkill for a lot of situations, but people are going for it anyway because they want the experience with it. It's also how, just fun to say. And it's, it's right, it's great to say, and there's some cool people here. Is it, How real is this? Is it overhyped? Does it matter from, from a VC perspective? Uh, it's always overhyped, right? Yeah, of course. Right, uh, so. <laughs> which is important because a lot want, of companies a make dynamic a significant thing, right, amount of money right, on right. overhyping. <laughs> uh, so we're sort of breaking big data into a few different areas, as it were. Um, and, and I thought, again, I thought Werner did a really good job of, of outlining this to some degree. There's the infrastructure piece. I mean, there are guys in there selling the, the, the guts, right? Whether it's hardware or software, often a combination of that, to enable you to you know, run analytics, to, to use kind of the big data concept. Whether you do it in-house or whether it's a cloud-based thing, I mean, they're happy to sell to Amazon if they would ever buy something externally. Okay. Yeah. But um, Tim the, uh, oh, Tim O'Reilly's here. She I'm getting gonna go. the I'm going to come back later. <laughs> I'll answer this question later. Uh, no, finish up. Go ahead. You sure? So, so yeah. bring Tim over. We'll have him. Ah, great. 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 Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's one area. The next is is really the capabilities to then leverage that. So, additional tools and technology. Say, okay, I've got all this stuff. What's the software that I need for my specific use case where I want to apply it? Then it's the providers, the cloud guys, other guys who want to run this stuff for you. And finally, it's the it's the companies that say, okay, how can I take this big data and make a ton of money off it? So we divide it in those four categories. I think. Uh, come in. I'm getting out of the way. You can tell me you disagree with my thesis, it would be helpful. So uh, yeah, we look at it in those four ways. I'll come back and tell you more about it later, but that's how we're dividing the buckets up. Some of those areas are, I think, overhyped. Others are, are completely underappreciated, in particular the end use, which is the people that no one knows yet who are going to look at this and say, wait a minute, you're telling me I can take that amount of information, process it through, and answer a question that I've always wondered, and they're, they're going to be the ones who literally change the world in certain areas. You know, the healthcare thing they're talking about today, this morning, was really compelling. And th there are some that we've seen already that are really interesting. Those are the guys who, at the end of the day, are going to make this real. But it's going to take some time to, to catch up, clearly, with you know, the, the discussion that we're having today around how big this is. So how long before we hear something from you in this space? Are we talking uh, weeks, months, days, hours? Uh, yeah, fair mm -hmm. Six months before this one probably announces anything. And the other one, uh, a little bit of time. But you know, hey, this is an area we're spending a lot of time in. So yeah, right. we may jump into something that's here today, and you'll hear about it in a week. So. Uh, Charles, I'm out thanks here. very much. Great Good to see you.